Welcome back to another episode of Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. On this episode of the show, we're breaking down the upcoming UFC Fight Night 52 event, which will play, take place on September 20th. Now, keep in mind this event is taking place in Japan, so it's only available on Fight Pass, and it's airing very early in the morning, uh, as far as, at least geographically, where I'm situated. So you'll have to set your alarm, or at least if you have Fight Pass, get up, don't read any of the, the uh, news sites, and check out the event live, as if it was live the way you can on Fight Pass. Um, coming up a pretty solid event, 7-4 and four at UFC Fight Night 51. I could have had a much better night had we not had a pretty significant upset in the main event, along with kind of a controversial Ternaldo Silva decision. It really could have gone either way. I thought Silva did enough. Nonetheless, he didn't get the job done. Fought a horrible third round, and that's kind of a disappointment. Uh, either way, six main card fights here. I'm looking forward to breaking them down, so please head over to KamikazeOverdrive.net for all of my preliminary breakdowns for this matchup. UFC 178, which could be one of the best pay-per-views of all time, or at least on paper it looks fantastic is uh, just around the corner. We'll be getting to that in the not-too-distant future. And I hope you like the uh, poster I, I did up for uh, this event. Those are the Gods of Thunder and Lightning, uh, Japanese mythical Gods of Thunder and Lightning I have in each corner, as at least I, what I researched, which I felt was appropriate considering who we have fighting in the main event and the uh, significant power that both of those individuals can pack. That's enough rambling for me. We've got a lot of fights to break down, so let's get to the first one. The main card gets started in the UFC's flyweight division is number 14th ranked Hayuchi Horiguchi, 13-1-0, battles the Heat, John Delos Reyes, with a record of 7 wins and 3 losses. Now, for Delos Reyes, this is his uh, f flyweight debut in his second fight in the UFC, he started at Bantamweight. Uh, he's coming off a 9-month layoff, which probably can't, a lot to do with cutting down and making the proper weight cut. He did look a little undersized at Bantamweight. Uh, this is his second fight flyweight for Horiguchi, who initially cut down... Uh, heading into his last bout after also debuting at Bantamweight. I think he should feel better physically, and but he looked very good in his debut, and that's certain. He went the distance and looked very effective there. Now, considering he fought at 132 pounds where he was the champion of the Shuto organization, it's not a huge cut, even though it's you know, a couple pounds less still. he's you know The weight cut seemed to not affect him at all. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here with the West to East Coast travel factor for Delos Reyes, who's normally used to fighting... Not fighting this time zone, so that could throw him off as well. We usually see east to west coast for Asian fighters coming over to North America. For Haraguchi, we know he's a Kid Yamamoto, one of Kid Yamamoto's training partners. He has significant power with eight of his 13 wins coming by knockout. He's drawn comparisons to the violent striking style of Yamamoto. He comes from a karate background. He's an incredibly big, powerful, straight right hand he likes to throw. He will lead with a left uh, head kick, which is also something very effective. He has an excellent chin, and he's willing to stand in the pocket and exchange. Uh, I really like his footwork, lots of movement, very light on his feet, good range management as well. Well when he is striking. Uh, when he looks to initiate, he covers distance exceptionally well. He's very hard at times. He doesn't have a specific rhythm. Lots of lateral movement, as I already mentioned. And, he, and he'll throw, you know, he'll follow his opponent and throw a nice big blitz with a 1-2-1. One, one. It's very, you know, a nice way to attack guys because they don't expect it coming the way he, you know, circles and keeps his rhythm very abnormal. Uh, when he fought Daryl Mont Montague, he hurt him with a big shot, a big quick right hand, followed up with a barrage, nearly put him away. Also landed a beautiful body kick that nearly finished Montague. Had him hurt badly going into the third round there. He holds his hands a little bit too low for my liking, though. But I guess at flyweight with a good chin, you can get away with that. Mo sometimes he has too much movement and not enough striking. Needs to push the pace and, and certainly put up the strikes if this fight goes the distance here. Uh, he has had defensive grappling issues in the past. His cardio has been a question mark, even though it did not seem at all to be an issue against uh, Montague in his flyweight debut. He was taken down in that matchup, but he got up very quickly. Uh, against Montague, he got caught in a couple of very tight sub attempts. In his debut against Daryl Pegg, he was, or uh, Dustin Pegg, he was taken down a couple of times. But again, that was against a much bigger opponent. Eventually rallied and got out of those positions. Now, for Delos Reyes, three wins by knockout, four submissions. He's an effective submish, uh, finisher. All seven of his fights have finished, wins have finished inside the distance. He's very wild and aggressive. He's an offense first, defense later, if he has time type of fighter. Uh, against Dustin Camori, he landed an exceptionally big right hand right off the bat in that fight. Uh, he was throwing very hard and aggressive, coming forward. He put Kimura down with a big shot early in that matchup and had him in some serious trouble. Uh, was landing some big top position strikes, postured up very well, and landed those power shots. But again, his aggression cost him. He was very over aggressive, got him caught in an arm bar. Something similar happened when he fought Russell Doan outside of the UFC, and he got caught in a situation where he lost, I think, by submission again in a, in a fight where he was winning and doing very well. Uh, I would think he might look to implement a ground based attack against Horiguchi and try to exploit some of those issues. But I think the distance striking for Horiguchi is going to force the Lareos to move forward, and that's going to leave him open for counters because of how reckless and aggressive he can be when he's trying to cover that distance. I, I expect to see Horiguchi land some big shots, land some counters, and my prediction is Koyuchi Horiguchi to defeat John De Reyes by knockout. Bumping up to the UFC's welterweight division, we have Strasser Kichi Kunamoto, 17-5-2 with one no contest, taking on Tough Nation's veteran 
filthy Richard Walsh with a record of eight wins and just a single defeat. Now, Kunamoto in his debut won a quick DQ, which was a little bit controversial. Then a submission win over Daniel Ser- Serafian in his next fight. Very impressive, but he's had very minimal UFC cage time despite having two uh, wins on his resume. Uh, his win over Serafian really caught people off guard. He submitted him fairly quickly. Uh, Serafian, though, he was cutting down to 170, keep in mind, and he looked like it physically took a toll on him. Uh, there was a bit of a question mark surrounding Kunamoto's previous uh, opponents and, and the toughness of his schedule heading into this UFC debut. Either way, so far, so good. Uh, he does train with Yushin Okami and Yoshihiro Akiyama, so he certainly has some quality training partners to work with. Uh, for Richard Walsh, this is his second UFC appearance uh, after the Ultimate Fighter. Really, it's his first non-Ultimate Fighter-related matchup in the UFC after beating uh, at least Chris Indich in his debut, so another Ultimate Fighter, actually a teammate on the Ultimate Fighter of Walsh's. Uh, for Walsh, he likes to use his strikes to set up his takedowns, uh, land a quick left jab or straight right when he is striking. Not a really a technical striker. Uh, will land a quick left hook, decent straight right, throws a lot of barrages and tries to overwhelm guys with volume. Uh, really likes to be in close, clinch, dirty box, land elbows, knees in close, tries to bully his opponent. He has a very high work rate. In his debut, he outlanded in- Indich uh, by a count of 4.73 strikes, landed per minute to just 0, uh, 0.8. So, you know, a pretty impressive, almost four strikes more per minute on Indich, which can add up significantly in a long fight. He does have four wins by knockout, so he's capable of putting guys down with his hands, but again, those are against lesser opponents on the Australian fighting scene. For Kunamoto, he's 2-1 in fights ended by knockout, so not really known for his striking power. Uh, he does have to throw a good straight right and was landing a nice low leg kick against Serapian and in his debut fight. He seemed a little bit uncomfortable or awkward at range. He wants to be in close. I think that's where he's going to try and take this fight. He's a very good grappler. He has a nice array of submission wins overall. Against uh, Luis Dutra in his debut, he looked for the takedown very early. Same thing that he clinched up with Serafian, and that's and landed a nice body lock takedown. And again, that's where he prefers to be in the clinch, on the cage, tying guys up, trying to outmuscle them, and trying to drag that fight to the ground. I think that's where he's going to look to put Walsh. But Walsh should be fairly comfortable in that position as well. Against Serafian, impressive back take. He really got on that position and locked in the rear naked choke almost right away. Didn't give Serafian even an opportunity to uh, defend. Now, for Walsh in the mat, he's a BJ Purple Belt, 1-1 one and one in fights ended by submission. He was also submitted on the show by Oliver Olivier Aubin Mercier, who's a very good grappler. Uh, he made a mistake, got put in a bad position, and couldn't get out of it. Uh, when he does look to implement his wrestling, he has a nice solid double leg uh, level, or level change for a double leg, which is pretty impressive. But he needs to watch his neck. He routinely sticks his head in too far when he's looking to take guys down, or even on attempted uh, uh, takedown attempts. And guys seem to recognize that. Chris Indich again attacked with a couple of guillotines, and I think Kunamoto could look to exploit that there. I think Kunamoto Kunamoto overall is the more refined grappler. I think he's going to surprise some people who are really banking on Walsh here. And my prediction is Kenji Kunamoto to defeat, to defeat Richard Walsh by submission. The next fight of the night takes place in the UFC's women's bantamweight division. And it's a very interesting matchup here as the former title challenger and strike force champion, the number two ranked Misha Cupcake Tate, 14 5 0, battles the debuting Rin Nakai, I believe, hopefully I'm saying that right, with an undefeated record of 16 wins and just a single draw. Uh, as this is the debut for Nakai, she's undefeated coming into this. She has wins over Tara La Rosa and Sarah Delelio, two you know, recognizable names here on the across the Atlantic Ocean. So pretty impressive victories there. But a lot of people still question some of her earlier fights, a padded record, some of those freak show matchups. She was the Pancrase women's champion. As I said, she's taking on Tate, who's the former Strike Force champion, so kind of a clash of champions there. Uh, Tate, high level experience coming into this. She has two submission losses in her career, both to Ronda Rousey, so it's kind of hard to say she's vulnerable on the mat to submissions because, you know, everyone's vulnerable on the mat to submissions when you're fighting Ronda Rousey. Uh, she did take Rousey the furthest out of anyone who's fought Rousey before. Uh, but the thing is, she's stuck in limbo here, having lost the champion twice fairly decisively. Yes, the division's shallow, but I don't think the is going to rush her back in another title opportunity and she'll have to put a lot of wins together and hold on to that spot at the top of the division. Uh, she's coming up kind of a controversial win over Liz Carmouche. A lot of people thought Carmouche did enough to win that matchup. I picked Carmouche in that fight. I thought she did as well, but Tate was able to sneak it out. Uh, now, looking for Nakai, she's going to be fairly new to the most of my listeners out here. Physically strong fighter. She should have a strength advantage when they do tie up and if they initiate the grappling. Uh, very strong grappler. Six wins by submissions. When she fought Delelio, she had a nice hip toss to put on her mat, on the back. And even though it went to decision, she was really rifling some nasty-looking Kimuras and, and nearly had it a couple of times. Uh, she has pretty good timing on her shot. She will look for suplexes. Fairly, you know, uses her strength and technique to put her to, to put opponents down in that fashion. Uh, solid take, uh, back take and rear naked choke against Brenda Gonzalez when she submitted her not that long ago. Uh, on the match, she tries to muscle her opponent. It's not a ton of ground and pound, more position, trying to advance and set up submission. She will drop some shots. Um, 
One of the things, though, keep in mind, she's fought a lot inside a cage, ring. I haven't seen any footage of her fighting inside of a cage, which can be an issue. It could help her if she learns how to use it to her advantage. It could also hurt her against a fighter like Misha Tate, who's so effective at using the cage and has so much experience. Now, Tate comes from a wrestling background, averages 2.95 takedowns per fight. She has six wins by submission. As I said, she's been submitted twice by Ronda. Uh, and she, to win the Strike Force title, she used her grappling base to eventually submit Marlos Kuhn and use some big takedowns. She also put Kat Zingano on the mat several times early in that match before eventually succumbing to the strikes. Uh, when she fought Liz Carmou, she was taken down multiple times, five times overall. So she can be taken down. Rousey took her down nine times. She can be taken down, but again, that's against a high level opponent. We're not sure where Nakai sits as far as, you know, against compared to guys like people are fighters like Liz Carmouche and Ronda Rousey. I would think overall Tate should be the more refined and technical grappler. And while well, Nakai might have a strength advantage, I would take skill over muscle in most of these situations. Uh, now, the big thing in this fight, which really could decide it, is Nakai striking. Hand, she keeps her hands up and uses a lot of movement, but not a lot of volume. We'll throw the odd low kick, but she's not a very good striker whatsoever, at least in the footage I've seen, and it's fairly recent footage. When she fought Tara LaRosa, which was her last matchup, she was getting cracked routinely by LaRosa. Uh, looks very uncomfortable, seems you know stuck on the outside, not sure how to get in without getting tagged. And LaRosa could have won that fight with a little bit more volume. She didn't do herself any favors either, not landing enough. Tate will be the better striker. She's been working to improve that part of her game. You know She's had trouble with good strikers in the past, but that's not going to be the case here who she's taking on. I expect to see Tate use a lot of jabs and kicks to keep Nakai at range, land combinations, keep her opponent backing up, which should take her wrestling out of the equation. Nakai's very, very raw. She's very one-dimensional as well, and she's taking, up a, taking a significant step up in competition. If she can get in consistently and take Misha down and grind her out, she could have the advantage there. But I think Tate's experience will help her you know, deal early on with what Nakai throws at her. I expect to see the... Uh, Nakai also slowed down in this matchup, and Misha to take it over. And my prediction is Misha Tate to defeat Rin Nakai by submission. Our next matchup is composer to the UFC's lost and found bin as we move to the welterweight division as Sexy Yama, Yoshihiro Akiyama, makes his return record of 13 wins, 5 losses, and 2 no contests, taking on former Ultimate Fighter winner Amir Sadala with a record of 7 wins and just 4 defeats. Now, originally this fight was said to be Kyle Noak versus Akiyama. I know they've wanted to get Akiyama back into Japan for a long time. He will be fighting at home here. He's incredibly popular. The crowd will be incredibly hot and in his favor. There's no question about that, no matter who he fights, whether it was Noak or now Amir. Uh, mass injuries and a little bit of a self-imposed exile on Akiyama's part have kept both individuals out of the cage for a long time. 31-month layoff for Yoshihiro Akiyama. That's a massive time away from the cage for Sadala, just short of two years. So he's been out of the cage for an exceptionally large amount of time as well. Now, looking at the age here, Amir's 34, uh, Akiyama's 39, but keep in mind, Amir's only fought 10 times, and Akiyama, although he's only he's had 20 professional fights, he also had a long judo career, so he's had a lot of wear and tear on his body, much more than Amir has. And I look at this, and I compare it to something I heard from my all-time greatest and favorite hockey players, Boston, former Boston Bruin captain Ray Bork. He said as he got older, as he wanted to maintain his physical state, a physical peak, he needed to, he could he couldn't stop. You couldn't slow down. You couldn't just take time off over the summer. You had to stay in top condition to keep up with the younger guys, or else you were going to have tremendous setbacks and slips, slip ups in your you know your ability to compete at the highest level. And I think that could be an issue here. I would think overall the impact's going to the layoffs going to impact Akiyama far more, and that's something we could see here. And th considering he didn't have great cardio before he went off on a break, you know that could be even worse here. But nothing is guaranteed at all. You know. You never know how that plays. You don't know how it's affected Amir as well. Now for Akiyama, this is his second fight at welterweight. He fought Shields the first time. He did not look great uh, in that matchup. His cardio, he, you know, he was did not a bad job, but it just wasn't a good performance. Now he's considerably older, almost three years older when we fought that fight. I think the weight cut could be even harder for him. I wouldn't be surprised if he misses weight. Uh, in that matchup against Shields, he was outlanded 119 to 52. Uh, he's very inactive on the feet. That's a big total to face a guy who like Jake Shields, who is more concerned about grappling and trying to take you down and not a striker, and to get out of that bad is a pretty rough thing to look at. Uh, now, the key to success for Akiyama will be his judo. There's no doubting that he's a fantastic judo player. Use those grappling skills, clinch, throw, control top position, really dominate him here and be physical, but that could be difficult for him if his cardio gives out. He does have seven wins by submission. The UFC has averaged 2.62 takedowns at 72% completion rate. We saw him have a lot of success against Chris Lee with his top game until he eventually was submitted. Uh, for Sadala, 60% takedown defense, so he has pretty decent takedown defense, but he has been put on his back before. Six times by Dung Young Kim, who's also a judo practitioner. Four times by George Lopez, also one of his most recent bouts, but he was still able to win that matchup. Amir can work off his back, but overall he does not want to be in that position 
against Akiyama. For Amir, he wants to use his Muay Thai. He holds the record for most landed leg kicks in a three-round fight, which is pretty darn impressive. He has a massive work rate, 4.95 strikes landed per minute versus Akiyama, who lands just shy of three strikes per minute, 2.75. So that gives Amir a big advantage if this fight goes deep in total strikes landed, if it stays in the feet. And uh, Akiyama actually gets hit roughly one strike more per minute than he lands. That's also an equation that doesn't favor the Japanese fighter either. Look for Sadal to use lots of KX combinations, does really well when he can back his opponent down and keep him backing up. And again, I expect to see Akiyama as he slows down starting to give up some of that distance. Akiyama's going to have to dominate on the ground. There's no denying that. And that's something, you know, we, he has to do to see. I don't think he'll be able to keep up on the feet. I think the UFC wanted him on this Japanese card. They needed to find someone that wouldn't blow him out of the water. I think Amir was an ideal matchup for him. Even though I think I still don't think it's a great matchup. I think it's a major step down for Akiyama as far as the, the talent he's faced in the past. I think it could be a little bit interesting early, but I think Akiyama slows down considerably after the opening frame. I think Amir outlands him, outworks him, and my prediction is Amir Sadala to defeat Yoshihiro Akiyama by decision. In the co-main event, we're in the UFC's lightweight division, the number 9 ranked Miles Fury Jury, undefeated at 14-0, battles the fireball kid and certainly going to be fan favorite, Takanori Gomi, with a record of 13, 35 wins, 9 losses, and a single no contest. Now, Jury, as I said, he's undefeated. He's training over the Lions training camp, so that's an incredibly good camp to be working out of right now. He's really a fighter on the rise and coming off with a number of solid fighters in that camp. For Gomi, he's winding down his career, but he showed of late he can still compete and do some damage at lightweight. Uh, but, you know, both guys recently fought Diego Sanchez. Jury clearly beat him, took a unanimous decision. Uh, for Gomi, he lost the fight. Many thought he did enough to felt he did enough to win that decision, and I thought he did as well. And Sanchez stole another decision like he just did against Ross Pearson. Uh, for Gomi, he's known for his brutal knockout power. We saw him stop Tyson Griffin. 13 wins by knockout overall. Uh, when he's striking, he's very unorthodox with his techniques. He likes to paw and throw at his left hand continually to kind of gauge the distance and keep his opponent honest. He will throw a quick right. I'm sure he'll throw a quick left hand, throw the right, and then come back with a low kick. It's a nice little three-piece three combination. Uh, overall, big looping hooks with powers where he likes to throw that hard overhand left. He will land some good body shots. We did saw that against Isaac Valley Flag. He hurt him to the body a couple of times. He has some decent low kicks. Maybe he doesn't use them enough, but he will go to them. Has some, uh, has you know, landed some decent uh, counter strikes against Valley Flag as well when he come forward. And he was landing some strikes moving back, which is you know something I didn't see enough of him earlier in his career. I think that can be a very effective way to knock guys out. We saw Chuck Liddell do that several times on his title run. Uh, he can have trouble with more technically based strikers who have a technically solid defensive game. He lands about .5 strikes more than he absorbs, which is not a great ratio, especially against a guy like Miles Jury. Looking at Jury, seven wins by knockout. We saw him have a brutal stoppage of uh, Ramsey Nijem. Lots of movement, head fakes. He's not, it's not a stationary target. Changes stances up, which always presents a varied front to his opponents when they are striking. I really like the way he slides away from attacks. He manages distance exceptionally well, and he does a very good job of limiting damage. He just lands 2.5 strikes per minute, so not even a to just under 3, but he limits his opponents to 1.23, which is very impressive to keep guys under that 1.5 mark because it just shows they're not piling up the damage unless you're Roy Nelson, one of these guys with big knockout power. You know, that's not enough. You're, you're not putting up enough against a guy like Jury to, to beat him. Uh, he has a nice counter right hand. We saw him land that against Diego a couple of times. Uh, when he came forward, he scored the knockout of Nijim in a similar fashion. He will also lead with that right hand. He has a very quick leg kick, and he can also go high, and he sets that up very well. One thing Jury does exceptionally well is he blends his wrestling and striking together. Land a right hand or a quick left jab, and then he changes levels for a takedown. He had some nice takedowns against Diego Sanchez, who's known for having solid takedown defense. We saw him absolutely dominate Michael Johnson on the mat. Really one of the last guys to really put it on Michael Johnson. Uh, four submissions wins overall. He's a BJ black belt, which is pretty darn impressive. And he averages 3.27 takedowns at 70%. So he's a very well-rounded fighter. There's no den denying that. We've seen Gomi in the past use a very low stance to try and thwart any attempts to get this fight to the ground, but he has notoriously struggled with grapplers. He's 6-6 six and six in fights ended by submission, and I anticipate he's going to be very tentative to engage Jury for fear of being taken down and being smothered like Michael Johnson was, like he was in the past. He has used his wrestling offensively, Gomi has, but still, it's something he's going to be at a loss to do in this match because Jury is simply the better grappler. Gomi's poor conditioning has also been an issue. He will slow down. In his last fight, he was breathing heavy in the first round. And Valley Flag, though, took enough damage and didn't really put it on him enough to, to take capitalize and take advantage of that. He was also struggling with the pressure in that in the matchup, and I think we'll see Miles Jury have a lot of success. Jury is the more diverse striker. He uses his wrestling incredibly effectively, and I'll show up here. And my prediction is Miles Jury to defeat Takanori Gomi by decision.
In the main event of the evening, we move to the UFC's heavyweight division as the number 7th ranked Super Samoan Mark Hunt, with a record of 9 wins, 8 losses, and a draw. Takes on the number 8th ranked Big Country Roy Nelson, with a record of 21 wins and 9 defeats. Uh, winner could be very close to a title shot in the division, and that's something to keep in mind here. The division's very thin, so string a couple impressive wins together, and you could be knocking on the door. Keep in mind, Mark Hunt's coming off a fairly lengthy layoff, nine months. In fact, Nelson has had more recent fights uh, than Hunt. Both guys are knockout artists and just are brutal when they land. Nelson, 14 wins by knockout. For Mark Hunt, six of his nine wins have come by KO. Obviously, Mark Hunt not having nearly as many fights as Nelson, but still a six of nine win knockout ratio is pretty impressive. Both have vaunted chins. But, and there's a but here, Nelson was stopped by Andrei Arlovsky in kind of controversial fashion. For Hunt, he was stopped by Junior Dos Santos and Melvin Manhoof, which is, Melvin hits hard, but he's not nearly a, he's not a heavyweight by any stretch of the imagination. We'll readdress that momentarily. Physically, they're very close in size, which is usually a major disadvantage that both guys have to deal with. And the speed factor could be interesting to see who has it. I would then think Roy would have it, but it's going to be hard to tell until they get in there together. Cardio could also be an issue if this fight goes deep, because keep in mind it's a five-round matchup. Uh, Hunt was coming off a five-round draw with Bigfoot Silva. Uh, he also KO'd Struve in the third round last time he was in Japan. And overall, which is pretty impressive, he's 6-1-1 one one in fights that go outside the first round, which is not something you'd expect from a guy who doesn't look to be in peak physical condition. For Roy Nelson, though, he's 2-8 and eight in decisions, uh, losing to guys like Daniel Cormier, Stephen Maiochik, uh, Fabricio Verdum, Frank Mir, Junior Santos, all by decision. So, you know, those guys know how to you know, go the distance and put it on Nelson and not get caught with that big shot. He only has one win over after the first round in recent memory, which came against Mirko Krokop, stopping him in the third round. And so far, the key to beating Roy Nelson is footwork, kicks, mix up your attack, stay on the outside, stay out of the way from his nuclear right hand, drag the fight deep, and you should have success. Unfortunately for Mark Hunt, he doesn't seem to fit the description of the guys who are going to fight like that. He likes to stand in the pocket, willing to exchange, not a lot of footwork. He's right there and he's hittable as well. He's hoping his chin holds up and the other guy's chin does not. The other thing to keep in mind here, Nelson's BJJ black belt. No submissions in recent memory, but he did you know, use a little bit of grappling against a kickboxer in Mirko Krokop. That fight was a little bit, a little bit ago. Uh, but he could go back to that. We've seen Hunt use it. He's got much improved defensive grappling. That's been a liability earlier in his career. He has six losses by knockout. He actually went offensive with his grappling, taking down Bigfoot Silva. Uh, but Nelson, we, I think he could use that crucifix here. We've seen him do it against Mirko Krokop. He also did it against Kimbo Slice in the Ultimate Fighter. But let's talk about striking because that's where this fight could very well be decided. For Hunt, he's a very patient striker. He likes to stalk his opponents. He has a beautiful leaping left hook and a step in right and a hard uppercut that he's going to throw. And I expect to see him use all of those in this matchup. We saw him rock Bigfoot so with a massive straight uh, straight right right down the middle. He steps in very well when he strikes, and standing elbow strikes are also something he will use as his opponents try to close the distance. Solid body kick, will go to the head, doesn't use a ton of stri uh, kicks. Again, that could be the fear of being taken off his feet. He was dropped by a big shot from Bigfoot early in that match. He was also hurt in the fourth round and nearly put away, which could have had something to do with fatigue as well. He tends to hold his right hand a little bit low, and he covers up and waits for the storm to pass, which could cost him against a guy who can throw around the guard. For Roy Nelson, he has that nuclear overhand right. One punch knockout power. He steps in and lands incredibly effectively with that overhand right, stopping guys like Big Nog, Dave Herman, Stefan Struve, Czech Congo, and Brandon Schaub, all with that, with that technique. He's willing to take a punch to land one, and these numbers are a little bit frightening. He lands 2.23 strikes landed per minute versus 5 strikes absorbed. For Hunt, he averages 1.2 strikes landed more per minute, so the advantage for Hunt is there if this fight goes deep. Nelson does use lots of head movement, tries to work his way in, throws a little bit of left jab. He will lower his head and feint, and then fire that overhand right, but he needs to watch a counter uppercut, which Hunt could very well look to time and sneak in there. Nelson also has a hard uppercut of his own. He landed that against Nog and hurt him. We saw him stop Matt Mitrione with it, and he will double up that right hook. But overall, he's not a very diverse striker, and that's cost him in the past. Not a ton of kicks, and that's you know something he wants to try and use to be diverse and keep guys guessing, but he doesn't you know seems to be more interested in just throwing that overhand right. And so far, it's working for him for the most part. When he's under attack, he shells up and can be an effective defense. But he took a lot of damage against Mirko Krokop, and that can cost him. Like I said with Mark Hunt, if you shell up and guys can punch around your guard, it will cost you and could end the fight. Uh, now going back to the knock of the chins, Hunt has been knocked out by a middleweight in Melvin Manhoof, which keep in mind, and his chin seems to be a little bit cracked in his last two matchups. Big, Bigfoot Silver hurt him a couple of times, and of course Junior Santos knocked him out, but that was a long, drawn-out battle and pretty impressive matchup nonetheless. For Nelson, he, he you know he's landed the, he, he's landed against swifter, more diverse strikers than Mark Hunt, guys that should have been able to avoid it and simply could not avoid that overhand right. 
I think both guys that are, are willing to take a shot, but I favor Nelson Chin in that matchup. And I think he has the ground game to exploit Mark Hunt. I think he can take him down, possibly get that crucifix, use that weight and size and skill on top and, and, and hurt him there as well. But I think Mark Hunt, Roy Nelson's going to land. I think he's going to shock a lot of people. And my prediction is Roy Nelson to defeat Mark Hunt by, of all things, knockout. So those are my six main card predictions for UFC Fight Night 52. Again, it's an early morning show, so make sure you set your alarms to get up or do whatever you need to do to make sure you can watch the show. The bet packs will be available at KamikazeOverdrive.net, just like all of my preliminary breakdowns will be available on the website as well. The panel's predictions will be there. We have one event, I think UFC 178, following this, and I think we have a pretty substantial break, which I'm looking forward to, as I have a major uh, event coming up in my life outside the MMA world, which I'm very excited and looking forward to. Uh, either way, thank you as always for listening, and I will see you right back here next time.